This is the Creative Funding Show, a podcast for authors, YouTubers, and podcasters who want to fund the work they love without selling out. Welcome back to the Creative Funding Show. I am Thomas Umstadt Jr. And with me today is Rachel Heron, who's a best-selling author of The Ones Who Matter Most, uh, which is an editor's pick by the Library Journal. Congratulations for that. As well as over 20 other novels and memoirs. And her latest nonfiction book is First Draft Your Memoir, Write Your Story, uh, Your Life Story in 45 Hours. And we have a links to both of those books in the show notes. Uh, she received her MFA in writing from Mills College, Oakland and she teaches writing in the extension program of UC Berkeley and Stanford. She basically teaches everywhere where they teach writing classes. She's also a proud New Zealander as well as a U.S. citizen, and her Kiwi accent only comes out when she's very tired. So the question is, Rachel, how tired are you? (laughs) Welcome to the show. (laughs) I'm good. I'm not too tired, so hopefully you won't hear the accent, although it is kind of fun fun. when it comes out. (laughs) So uh, tell us a little bit about how you got started writing. Oh, my gosh. I'm one of those cliches who, you know, as soon as I knew that there was a person behind books, you know, when I was a kid and I learned out that 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 was a job, I wanted to be that person. But then I really got off track for a long time. And everybody told me you couldn't make money writing books. And, and I went to school for business and hated everything, (laughs) switched my major. (laughs) Um, Finally, did English, uh, got my master's in creative writing, and then proceeded to spend seven years spinning my wheels, not really writing much of anything. I was always trying to write the great literary, you know, the great American novel um, and putting, you know, 500 page manuscripts into the desk drawer because nothing happened in them. They were just character sketches. They were terrible. They were really terrible. I feel like everyone goes through that. There's this series at the beginning. It's kind of like when you get into a shower and you turn on the hot water, you just got to let the cold water flow through the pipe. (laughs) It's like that bad writing. Once it gets out of you, there's good writing clogged up behind it. It'll come out eventually. What a great analogy. I absolutely love that. Yes. Yes, that's exactly it. And so then my sister in uh, 2006 told me about National Novel Writing Month. NaNoWriMo, which is this online challenge where you write 50,000 words in the month of November. And I proceeded to tell her that I was a serious literary writer, and I would never stoop to something like that. And uh, then, of course, as soon as she left, I was Googling it and signing up for it. Because (laughs) I really needed a gig secretly, yes. I needed a kick in my butt to actually do some work. Um, But in order to write a novel in a month, you have to write fast and you have to write badly. So for the first time, I really just got out of my inner editor's way and let terrible prose flow onto the page. And what ended up happening, what happens a lot in National Novel Writing Month books is that we write better than we ever thought we could um, because we're out of the critic's way. And when I went back and looked at it a few months later, I thought, oh my gosh, well, this is kind of terrible. Yes, but it's revisable. It was the first revisable thing I'd ever written. And that ended up getting me my first three book deal with um, HarperCollins and an agent. So... It, it was it was fantastic, and I haven't looked back since. That's awesome. And that is a common story. Not that everyone, you know, with their first manuscript from NaNoWriMo gets an agent, of course. But yeah. uh, so many of the novelists uh, that I talk with got their start or their breakout doing NaNoWriMo, partly because I think that it builds that discipline. Yes. Uh, to be a successful writer, you have to be a disciplined writer. Absolutely. You know, the idea of, like, the binging, drunken writer, you know, it's not really reality. <laughs> it's really not. Yeah. I mean, you might get some words done that way, but I don't recommend it. <laughs> That's right. It's romantic. And you know, is, those writers yeah. die young and poor and someone later finds their manuscripts and makes them famous. It's like, <laughs> even when that does happen, do you really want that to happen to you? Do you want that to be your story? <laughs> I, I'd rather be healthy. Yeah. <laughs> so what kind of books are you? Uh, did you start writing after that initial trilogy? Um, so those were romance. And I wrote um, a lot of those real uh, kind of feminist romances on the lighter side um, brighter and happy and then I have since then I've written a bunch of um, darker mainstream literary novels for Penguin uh, you know in which people die and families recover uh, which I love and I've written a memoir I've written this nonfiction about writing memoir because it turns out that teaching memoir is just my favorite thing in the whole world because um, when you teach memoir you're teaching people not only the structure 
of story, but you're a lot of times teaching brand new people to write, like the, not brand new people like babies, but brand new writers to write. These are people who have never tried writing before, but they have a good story. You know, they, they want to tell about their lives. So I just find that incredibly exciting. And that's really important. And I feel like for a lot of authors, their first book is a memoir, whether they intend it to be or not. And Absolutely. If it's a novel, it's like the protagonist is very suspiciously similar to the author. And that 500, sense, exact, that 500 page novel that will never see the light of day was just a terrible memoir. That's all it was. Yeah. Even even uh, people like C.S. Lewis, right, who writes The Chronicles of Narnia, his first book was A Pilgrim's Regress, which everyone considers to be his worst book, and it's bas- basically his memoir. And what's funny is that he revisits memoir later on in his career with, like, uh, grief. Uh, he wrote one about grief where he basically just wrote about what it was like losing his wife. And it's brilliant, and it sells like oh, crazy. I have to read that, and I love him. <laughs> yeah, but his initial book, like, Pilgrim's Regress, I was, you know, speaking at a C.S. Lewis conference. And they're like, read this one last. It's it's not his best work. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, gosh, if that can happen to C.S. Lewis, it can happen to anybody. That's so cool that you were at a, at a C.S. Lewis conference, though. How rad is that? Yeah, it's a, it, he's very popular here in Texas. There's like two different organizations for C.S. Lewis and their rivals and they throw uh, conferences. But anyway. Um, wow. So- <laughs> It's very popular. Uh, <laughs> back back to your books, though. Um, so you're traditionally published. You've had a bunch of traditional contracts, uh, but you're also on Patreon. So why? Uh, and I'm also self published. And you're also self published. Yeah, I do. I, I'm now hybrid. I pro- I publish my romance um, mostly by myself. A, a, a Random House in Australia publishes some, but I really like retaining the control of the romance. So, and, and is that the primary reason why uh, you've gone hybrid is to have that greater control? Oh yeah, and it pays more. <laughs> <laughs> the real reason. Absolutely, yeah. You get, you know, 60 to 70% of royalties when you self-publish and romance sells well. Right. Um, so, I, but, but literary fiction still doesn't sell that well self-published it, it still is helpful to go through a traditional publisher and i love my agent so so we kind of break it up that way we're we're friendly about that that's a good way to do it when people ask me what they should do i, I tell them that the primary benefits of being traditionally published is that they give you contacts and credibility and capital. So if you need a lot of money, uh, they put up the money for the editors and all of those things. But if you already have enough money from previous successes, and you already have the contacts from being in the industry, and you have previous successes that give you the credibility, you don't need those three C's nearly as much. Absolutely. Like, I've never heard it said that concisely. And that is absolutely true. And so I, I fully support your your breaking out into hybrid because it's a very shrewd business move. And because since you're not needing those things, you are uh, you don't need to pay them because you pay a huge premium, right? The amount, a typical royalty is, you know, eight to 20%, depending on, you know, your previous success and your agent and all these things. And, you know, when the best is 20% and the worst you're getting with tradition with self publishing is 30% and the best is 70% it's two totally different worlds totally different games yeah and honestly for my traditional deals you know it's i usually get closer to 8 to 12% i actually make more sometimes on the amazon affiliate clicks to buy the book than i do on the sale of the book. <laughs> yes, that's uh, so real quick uh, for the people who don't understand what is amazon affiliates program and how do you make money on that Anyone can do that, even if you don't have a book out. You could have a, um, if you set up an affiliates account with Amazon and you send out, say, a newsletter or you have a website, you can say, buy this, buy this book. You can say, buy my book or buy someone else's book. Here's my affiliate link. And then, I, what do you make on that? I think you make between 10. 10 and it's between four and eight percent depending on how many units you sell but it's between four and eight percent of their entire cart so if they if a reader buys your book and a new macbook pro which happens yes or a bag of dog food or whatever else people buy on amazon because they sell everything that there is to buy uh you get a commission on that whole thing and typically november and december are people's best months because that happens you know they are they are looking at your book that you promoted to them but also their shopping cart is full of all the Christmas presents. It makes a, sen- a good sense to do a Black Friday promotion on your book if for no other reason than to get that affiliate cookie on people's computers so that they do their Black Friday shopping with uh, your book in their cart. So true. I'm going to do that this year. So true. <laughs> so talking about creative funding, that's a really easy and creative way uh, to fund your book. Um, but you're also on Patreon. So tell us a little bit. Uh, why, why did you start a Patreon page? Okay, so I started my Patreon page 
A while after I heard about it, I um, I actually wish I'd even jumped on it sooner, but it is not too late, I'm here to say. I have friends doing this also. But um, it was about two and a half years ago. Two, yeah, two and a half years ago, I was really uh, needing to get out of my day job, and I was very close. Um, I was a 911 dispatcher for a fire and medical. I've worked in the fire station lived there for 48 hours at a time, went home for four days and then back for two days. And it was really taking, I loved the job, um, but it was really taking a toll on my physical health, um, just, you know, to go that long without regular sleep all the time. And I'd done it for 15 years since I got my master's, 17 years. And all that time I'd also been writing. And for the last 10 years, I'd been publishing books. Um, So I was getting close to the amount I would need to have every month reliably, but there was just this little gap that I needed to fill. Um, And I thought, boy, if I could make $1,000 a month reliably, that would really, really make me feel more secure. I know it sounds like a small amount in order to make a large jump like that, but I knew what I needed to bring in per month to keep, you know, I live in the Bay Area to keep our household going with with my partner's um, salary as well. And so I decided to try Patreon. And the nice thing is, is that I already had readers. And that's that that helped a lot. Because if you have a couple readers, you know, if you have 10 fans who want to read what you write, and you only pro- and you produce some stuff that nobody can get unless they're on Patreon, then they're going to support you. Yeah, the key to crowdfunding is to have a crowd. <laughs> it's not the place to find a crowd. This is a common mistake that people make with Kickstarter and with Patreon too. Is that they think that you know if I put my campaign here, people will discover my music or my writing or my YouTube channel through a Patreon, and that's not where people go to discover new content. That's where people go to fund the content they're already in love with, fund the creators that they're already familiar with. And so there is a certain amount of grunt work you have to do ahead of time, building up that following, building up that audience of people who know, like, and trust you before you're ready to say, okay, now I want you to back me on Patreon. Yes. I think that there is some slow build, though, that you can do. You don't have to wait until you have a massive mailing list to start a Patreon. You can start it with a low number of supporters, um, but you have to be willing to know what you will do for them and how much time you're willing to spend on it. For example, when I started my Patreon, um, the the concept behind it was I was going to write um, one essay a month. I, I, I'm on Patreon on the per thing model, not the per month model. So basically I have to produce a thing in order to get paid. I can do that up to every four weeks. So I really try to do that every four weeks. So it's I good paid. motivation to write that essay. <laughs> it's great motivation. Um, so and my yeah, what I was writing was um, essays on living the creative life, just on creativity in the brain and how we work as creative people. And, but I did the math and I wanted these essays to be to start out being around 2,500 words and I wanted them to be good and I wanted them to be researched and well conceived and well executed. And I decided I did not want to do that every month for less than $500. And that's the cap I put on it. Um, And that's that's that was basically the first goal. And the nice thing about that is I could open it up and people could pledge. And if I didn't hit $500, I made that my goal. I never had to do a thing. The Patreon basically was not a go. And since you weren't creating the content, since it was a per thing model, it didn't zap everyone's credit cards. You're able to collect those credit card numbers in Patreon. So it's actually a really clever approach. It's kind of like Kickstarter's all or nothing deal. You know, you're putting on a conference for $20,000 and only $2,000 worth of people, you know, back your uh, page. Well, the conference doesn't happen. No one is charged. Everyone is fine. Nothing is ruined. And that is because that's one of the scary things, right? What if you only have 20 backers on Patreon and now you have to do all of this work and to keep them happy. And so... yeah, no way. That, yeah, <laughs> I don't have time for a, that. Right. That's a good argument for the per thing uh, reward model uh, is that it allows you to build up an audience without charging them if, if what you're doing is a lot of work. I have to tell you, it funded pretty quickly, and um, which was awesome because I do, you know, I did have a nice mailing list. And for months, I was really busy. I was still working both jobs. And I would go three or four months without writing an essay. 
until one of my friends basically said, you are literally leaving money on the table. What is <laughs> wrong with you? That is money. It's not free money. You're working for it. But you're leaving it there. And I just thought, well, okay, that's ridiculous. So I haven't actually missed a month since then. But if you ever notice on Patreon, if, if you're a supporter, um, if you're a per thing, <laughs> you'll get a lot of things on the 31st <laughs> in the evening <laughs> because they have to be out by the 31st in order to get paid five days later on the 5th. So <laughs> there's a lot of Patreon people who are busy on the 31st. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a good day for Patreon's website to go down. <laughs> oh, no. No, they would hear about that. Obviously, I don't write an essay on the last day, but I'm definitely putting the last touches on it that day. Right. So so walk us through the process of setting up the Patreon page uh, for the first time. Uh, what was that like? What did you do? And what was your thinking going into it? I had, I had, um, I had one main thing that I really wasn't that comfortable with yet and but I knew that I had to put together a friendly looking and sounding video uh, because those were the Patreon campaigns that I had really responded to before um, if you know uh, NK Jemison she's a um, science fiction writer somebody had posted something yeah I think it was um um, Scalzi, John Scalzi had posted, you should go check out her Patreon. She wants to quit her day job. And, and her pitch was so compelling that I threw her a dollar every month because she was adorable. I don't read science fiction for the most part. Um, I don't, I don't need to ever keep up with her, but I'm really happy to give her a dollar every month. And she was able to do it. You know, it, it just took off. Um, so I knew that I wanted to do a good video and that's what I really spent the most time thinking about and, and being very honest I think that we get a lot of traction um, from being really authentic. And so I came forward and I said, this is me. Um, I write mostly fiction, but truthfully, what I love to write most is creative nonfiction. That is, that's just my jam. And I don't have time to do that while I'm writing books. If this funds, this will pay for my time in writing these. And people just really responded. It's a really good video. And for those of you listening, we'll have a link to her Patreon page in the app. So just scroll down on in podcast app or whatever app you're using. You can tap to go view this video. And it's part of the reason why I invited you to come on the show. Because, you know, as I was researching your page, I watched the video. I was like, oh, this is a, a well done video. It's a little bit longer than videos normally are. But you hold the attention, uh, or at least you held awesome. my attention all the way through and oh, the thanks. audio was good <laughs> so uh and i think that that's really important you know people need to be able to hear you in a very clear way and how, how did you film it did you do it on your webcam i did it on my webcam on my mac uh, macbook air and i do have a professional mic that i use for podcasting so i already had those two things for me um and that but but i re I'm, I'm much more comfortable with the video medium now because i do video podcasting as well but but back then i think this was one of my very first attempts so <laughs> I'm glad it worked out. <laughs> yeah, I will say, because I look at a lot of Patreon pages and a lot of authors skip the video. They and I shouldn't. think that they're really missing out when they do that. And they're like, oh, well, I don't look the way people think that an author should look. And it's like, that's not what matters. And none you of know, us do. The authentic you is what people want to see. No one's wanting a supermodel on the camera. They're wanting you and they want to know what you look like. 100% I can tell you that I gave to a Patreon campaign Um in which the woman's glasses were on crooked. And I was just like, she is so real right now. You know, she is just being real. And she's talking about her passion. I was like, you deserve my dollar, ma'am. You know? <laughs> I want I want authentic. That's right. what I want. And I think that that's a really key point because this isn't you reaching the masses. This isn't you selling your thousands of books to your thousands of readers. These are your core insiders. This isn't your concert at Madison Square Garden. This is your house party concert or your house. What are they, like what's, what do they call it when it's a house concert? Like yeah, house party. Yeah, yeah, house party. Uh, yeah. The, the musicians have a term for that. It, it's there is, and I can't like, remember what it is. Yeah. But, <laughs> but like, being invited to that or like the Beatles' last concert that was on the roof of some house, right? Like that's what this is. That's what Patreon is. And that's why people are paying the money is that they feel like they get access to that inside-ness part, right? They get to see what your house looks like and they, you know, they get to see what you look like. And, and that access is part of the appeal. It's part of why certain people are going to want to come to your Patreon page. So you And they through... honestly know that that they're actually making a difference. And I make sure that I, I keep telling them that. They're not, you know, this this these one dollars seem like such a small amount, but they just add up. 
to uh, to make a real difference in artists' lives. And that's what I love about Patreon. That's right. And I don't know if you do this, but a lot of creators will reach out to every single patron when they first sign up and say thank you and like start that conversation. And that can be really powerful, although it's not scalable. I don't know why I'd never even thought about doing that. That's just such a great idea. That's a, that's a light bulb moment. I'm going to start doing that from now on. Yay. Well, there you go. Uh, <laughs> so I, I started doing it and uh, with the Creative Funding Show Patreon, which I'm doing just as a test bed. My real Patreon is the Novel Marketing Show. But I've already started getting guests from that. They're like, oh, you know, I, or I'll go. Somebody will back the Patreon. And I'm like, oh, I check out their Patreon page. And like, they're doing some creative things. Let's see if they'll be a guest on the show. And, oh. Oh, how cool. <laughs> Reach out to them that way. And I found that some of our best interactions with our fans are the people who back us on Patreon because these are our best fans. And I'm like, man, I'd love to talk to these people. These people are interesting and fascinating and, and they believe in what we're doing. And if you have patrons, they believe in what you're doing. And, you know, it's great to interact with them. So um, back to your Patreon page. Uh, so you create the page, you create your video, you set up some uh, rewards, which we'll talk about in a second. But how did you promote it? How did you let the world know about about your Patreon page. I did the thing on social media where I prepped people for it. I said, I'm going to do this. Um, so I think that some people were actually on the lookout for it, which was great. You know, I, I think I said like tomorrow I'll be launching it. Um, and then I launched pretty quickly because I'm one of those people I get a, I get a bug and I got to do it right now. Um, and then I pushed out on all the social media channels uh, plus my mailing list. And I sent it to everybody on my mailing list, and I knew that I would get unsubscribes for it because that just that just happens; it's natural. Um, but there were there were fewer unsubscribes than I thought, and that's really where the money came in immediately. I think I hit the five hundred um, goal that the first day or two. Oh, very nice. And then and then since then, it's just been growing slowly. And now I'm just looking at the page; it's up to uh, thirteen seventy seven, one thousand three hundred seventy seven dollars per essay per month. Very nice. And I will say email is so powerful. Yeah. And it really does and drive best. those numbers. How big was your list when you first announced it? When I first announced it, I bet it wasn't more than 4,000 people. And has it grown since then? Yeah, it's about doubled. Um, I'm more I'm more than 8,000 now, which I know to some people like in the biz might not sound like many, but I, I don't ever do newsletter swaps. I don't... Um, I don't get any fans that do not self-select in. I don't go looking for them. Um, you must go to my website and say, I want to know about Rachel in order to get there. So um, those are, those are, it's a, it's a really good group and it's got a really high open rate on my emails. Yeah. So it's like the 300 Spartans or the 8,000 Spartans. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, uh, so one thing you might consider uh, is, and I talked with uh, another guest about this and she put it in practice and her patronage doubled or, or sorry, 50% increased in about a week is to do like a pledge drive. Oh my gosh. There's I a short term reward where it's like everyone who becomes a patron in the next two weeks and all of my existing patrons get some bonus. So like for you, maybe it's a, a bonus essay. So in a month you write two essays. It Because what I found is that for a lot of um, Patreon users, they have people who are on the fence or who want to become patrons. They're just putting it off till tomorrow and they'll put it off for tomorrow for a year. And all they need is that little uh, sense of urgency. And suddenly you get a flood of new patrons uh, coming in. And I could, I, I realized that I haven't actually asked people to join my Patreon since it started. Oh, wow. I put, I just, I'm very bad at things like that. I put the link in all my emails, you know, it's there next to Twitter, Facebook, Patreon. Um, but I have never done anything like that. So I think uh, you're, you're, you're brightening my day with this. I'm totally going to do that. So there you go. Okay. I feel like a good Patreon promotion model looks kind of like a heartbeat where you got these big surges of attention and then it's kind of da -da -da -da, and then big surges and those big surges happen every year or so. Uh, and, you know, it works for PBS, National Public Broadcasting. Yeah. You know, they do their big pledge drive once a year and their, their whole push in that pledge drive is to get people to sign up on a monthly basis. It's not, you know, give us a big lump sum. And part of what that does is it also forces them to remind the people who've been giving every month why they're doing it. You know, you know, they reminded, oh, I feel so good about giving to PBS. And in a sense, the patronage model is for creating content, videos. And, you know, that's exactly what PBS has been doing for a long time. And uh, they've learned a thing or two that we can uh, steal some of their ideas. I love that. And people eventually, people like me eventually give out of guilt. You're like, I am still cooking dinner on the fourth <laughs> night and I have not given yet. Yeah. <laughs> 
All right. So so walk us through your rewards. What uh, to Take us through the $1 reward. What do people get when they uh, give you a dollar on your Patreon campaign? Okay. So for $1, um, they all get a digital version of each essay as soon as it's released. Um, it's the bare minimum. They also, um, I'm realizing it says here, they'll receive the MP3 of me reading the essay a month before it's released in podcast form. I actually never launched the, po- the podcast and I generally do make an MP3 recording um, if I have time, but it's not um, my priority and it's not what people love the most. They really want the essay itself. But what you're giving them is even more exclusive because it's not a month before it's released in podcast form. It's the <laughs> only way to get it. <laughs> it. It literally is the only way to get it. I should really clarify that. And then I say that their name will be listed in the acknowledgments of the 12 essay collection. And this is a good point time to point out for writers when you set yourself up like this, whether you're doing nonfiction or short stories, or um, you could, you know, do chapters of a novel this way, if you if you if you were good about that kind of planning and plotting, um, you're you're giving yourself an advance for a book. Right now, um, my agent has the first twelve essay collection um, that she's taking out. The second essay collection is the one I'm writing right now, currently. Um, and it is about uh, refilling the well, and I think I'll probably just self-publish that. I'll choose to keep that. Um, but you're basic. You're you're writing books. There's nothing that says that um, after you give this to your patrons, you can't reuse it in into a book. So it's it's awesome. It's so cool. Yeah, and it's a, another way to have your cake and eat it too. Because I know some authors will release their book to anyone on any platform on Patreon. And then a few months later, it's Amazon Kindle exclusive with the KDP Select program with all of the perks and benefits and lock-in that that comes from. So they're able to say, hey, if you want to read my book on Kobo, you know, just back me on Patreon. You'll get your chance to get it on Kobo. But then after that, it gets locked into Amazon. That's a great, yeah, that's a great way to do it. And then, but then I would, I would push for going wide after that. I just, I really believe in being wide with our books as much as we can. This is a, a trend I'm noticing amongst the kind of people who use Patreon. They like to have lots of different sources of income. <laughs> so yes, absolutely. Go, going wide has that advantage. Uh, where I getting... do not want to put all my eggs in Amazon's basket, although they do pay most of my bills. That's right. So. All right. So tell us about your $3 level. $3 level. This is my favorite level. Um, this is what I call the ACE level. They get all those rewards plus texts from me. And um, to share with your listeners. Um, basically, I text people three to five times a week through a service which doesn't share their phone number with me and doesn't show share my phone number with them. I use something called remind.com. It is a free app that is for teachers. And basically, you create a classroom. And you know, it's it's supposed to be so that your, you know, second grade teacher can communicate easily with all the parents before the field trip. Um, but I'm also teaching people. I'm also a teacher. And your listeners can be teachers and create classrooms. And I can either go in and spontaneously send a text or I can queue them up um, for the week and send them out at scheduled intervals. The nice thing is, is that people can text back and it comes into my email inbox. So once I send the text, these, you know, the responses will start coming back and I can quickly jot back to them. So it really is a very one-on-one communication. And people know that if they text back to me, I'll text back saying, you know, great, good for you. Or, you know, I'm sorry that that happened. So I I love that. that. And I love that you're using a service. And we'll have a link to remind.com in the show notes uh, for those of you who want to check that out. Because sending a text one person to one person doesn't scale at all, right? You have 82 patrons at this level. And if you had to send them all in a text you know, individually and then they're calling you at midnight or pocket dialing you, it's just <laughs> exactly. a nightmare, right? Exactly. And, and yet with this service, you're able to have what is a very intimate form of communication. There's nothing more intimate than a text message, right? This, the people Think about the kind of text you get in a daily basis. It's mostly from your most innermost circle, right? You're not getting texts from strangers. And there it, it's not a violation for you to do this because they're opting in, right? The only reason they're going to pay you is that they want to exactly. get that text from they you. They want this. And of those 82 patrons who get those texts, I would say to every text that I send, I probably get 10 responses. And I generally respond back with a yay or a smiley face or something. It takes me seconds to do that as I'm, you know, 
wading through my email anyway. It's it's and I and I mean it. I love hearing about their lives. They can send me pictures. Sometimes they send me little videos of things that they're looking at. It's fantastic. That's great. And the other thing I love about that is that since it's text, they're not looking for an epistle from you. Right? Sometimes with email, I, and we get this in the novel marketing podcast. We have people will email us these big long epistles of like big marketing yes. challenges. And so with we tons sometimes of email questions. back. Right? We have lots of engagement, but it's a lot of work, right? It's a, it's not the same as like, oh, that's great. Smiley face. You know, that's a lot <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> All right. So tell us about the $5 level. At the $5 level, that is the star level. Um, they get exclusive access to a question and answer video that I film in response. Um, you'll notice there that I don't say that I do it every month because sometimes I don't. Sometimes I don't have questions. People don't send them to me. Um, often... Every couple of months, I'll send a, a Patreon note out just to people just saying, if you've got any questions, I'll answer them. And then I answer completely honestly. There's nothing that they can't ask um, about either the creative process or about my life or, or whatever it is. Um, so that is cool. And you record that as a private YouTube video, and then you embed it in the Patreon post so that the only people who can find it are because Patreon makes it really easy to say only $5 and above uh, can see this video. Exactly. So super, super it, easy. It's fascinating to see how different creators use the Q&A because this is a common tool. A lot of people do the Q&A, you know, creation. And for some people, it's everybody gets it, right? Everybody at $1 or more gets the Q&A. And it's like, jo Joanna Penn does it this way. And she gets, you know, 40 minutes worth of questions and she answers questions. And that's a big part of it. Whereas what you're doing here, it's video instead of audio. And it's a little bit more intimate. And all questions are answered, <laughs> which is easier to do that when there's only, you know, 40 people, 50 people getting that level where it's like you're now invited into the inner sanctum. Although and, the it, sanctum, and it really is. Yeah. But the sanctums get even more inner. So tell us about the $10 <laughs> level. <laughs> so the $10 level, that's the superstar. Um, they get an exclusive. They get everything else, of course, plus the exclusive pep talk email on Living Creatively. Um, from me when each essay is delivered. And that's not very long, um, usually. And then I think more importantly than that, they get the digital e version of the essay collection when it's complete. And that's actually something that will need to be, um, if my agent sells it, um, it'll just be written into the contract. You know, these, how many people are there? There's 34, there's about 45 people who would get this. Um, and they would just need to get the digital arc. They would all all get the digital uh, advanced readers copy because they that's my agreement to them. And even if you had to buy it at a discount from your publisher, at ten dollars a month for multiple months, it still works out, right? This, it absolutely. You don't have to that. have the contract negotiated ahead of time with the publisher because you know, regardless of how it happens, it's still a good deal. And ultimately, they're not buying this because they want to get a discount, right? This is a really important thing. They are not. This, these aren't discount hunters. These are your core fans who are wanting to support you even more. And this is one of the things that was surprised me with Patreon a little bit is that we have backers of the Novel Marketing Podcast who back at a level higher than our highest level. <laughs> like they're wanting to support us at a certain amount. And so they're just picking the number and they're, even though there's no reward level even close to there because they they like what we're doing so much, they're wanting to help us out. And, and you have people like that Potentially, you know, the bigger your audience is, obviously, the more people like that there are. And they they want to give you that money. And so you don't have to, like, sometimes with Patreon pages, people are, like, spending their whole day, like, oh, I'll give you whatever you want. It's a little, very exhausting for them. And it doesn't have to be that necessarily. And I don't think it should be that. I, I really don't think it should be that. Um, and that's funny that you say that. I've A couple of times I've met patrons in the real world. And... And one, one time I said, you know, thanks so much for supporting me. I hope that you enjoy the essays. And she said, what essays? <laughs> she just hadn't, she had never noticed. She didn't care. She just wanted to support me, which is incredible. And I always tell people to, to put bigger um, rewards than you think will ever be picked up just to see what happens. Like I put the $100 rewards and people pick them up. Yeah, we, we saw that uh, with novel marketing uh, at our top level, which was is sold out and isn't published anymore. You get your book featured on the podcast and probably 30 percent of the people who back to that level has have not sent us their book name. <laughs> they just wanted to back at that level, which has been really good for the other people because they're getting their books in rotation. Um, Absolutely. More often. Yeah. All right. So tell us about the twenty five dollar level. Twenty five is everything above plus a physical signed copy of the book that comes out of the Patreon essays or the books um, signed, mailed to them from me. All right. And you have eight people at that. And then you have the $50 champion level. I've, I've got one person at this and they get everything of that plus a signed copy of every single new book I release. And no matter what publisher, 
Um, no matter if I, you know, if I do it, just uh, mailed to them, sealed with a heartfelt kiss. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And now you have a hundred dollar level, and you have five people. So you limited this to twenty total, and so far five people have backed you at the hundred dollar level. What are what what are you giving at the hundred dollar level? I just can't believe that people do this. Like, it's just like. This just opens my heart and fills it with so much love. It's amazing. Um, at this, they get everything above, plus creativity coaching, 30 to 60 minutes of one-on-one -on -one time with me over a month over Skype. Um, they get a recording of this. Um, and I have to tell you that I have, I think three of those people have never taken me up on that. One has never even responded to my emails trying to get her to take like it's like she'll text me back so i know she is alive um <laughs> she'll text me back in those little texts but but when i say you know would you like to get together on skype nope no no response it's just support that's awesome isn't that beautiful that that really and it's isn't it's really encouraging right when you're sitting down to write an essay you know that there are certain people who are just wanting to support you know your mission you know because these essays are you know, you're trying to say something with these that's not just like fluff and people are wanting you to say that so much that they're willing to put down $100 just to make that happen. It's incredible. Uh, there's a um, a level I, I've known some people do is like a mastermind call where everyone at a certain level is all together on a single Skype call. So you do them all at once. Uh, but with you, it, you don't really need to do that since most of them, they're not doing it for the Skype call. <laughs> they're doing it because they can afford $100 and they, they want to uh, kick that in. So I, I love what you're doing with these. And, I, and what's really smart is that these are all very scalable. The one that's not, you very smartly limited, right? Because you, let's say 50 people signed up to have these calls. That suddenly is undermining your week. Even though it's really good money, it's keeping you from doing your actual writing because you're on these Skype calls all the time. And I remember uh, a mistake, a classic Kickstarter mistake, the producer of a indie film said, everyone who backs for $100 or more gets a Skype call from me. And the indie film went viral. Oh, no. And they had like a thousand people back at that level. And so he had what for an introvert like me is like my own personal hell of 1000 Skype calls with complete strangers. One no, that after is another. awful. <laughs> that terrifies me just to think of and but you've got to you've got to come through right you know and and but, but imagine you're trying so you've got a lot of and i don't remember what indie film this was but you've got a lot of attention on this film a lot of money's come in people are really wanting you to make this film but instead of working with the director and working with the actors and pulling things together for site <laughs> locations and stuff it's like talking to one and having what is it affect i imagine the same conversation over and over again because people will ask the same questions and it's just like please never oh, again God. <laughs> so, that's when you want to hi hire your doppelganger to sit in your for a little while <laughs> that's right and i think the important principle here is you always want to ask the question what if this becomes insanely popular am i protected so there's the much more common fear is what if no one comes and that that's something you have to kind of have in your mind but you also need to be like what if oprah mentions me on her things that i love you know email or on her whatever it is she's doing right now and suddenly a million people come to this page how can i handle that is this scalable if things get really popular and you've done a great job protecting yourself good and i hope that oprah does mention me at some point <laughs> that would be awesome hey, you never know maybe she's listening <laughs> to the creative funding show right now her, her people are, are getting on the on the phone with you um <laughs> or with you <laughs> yeah there you go um what what advice would you have we're running out of time real quick but i want to ask you uh what advice do you have for people who are uh, thinking about launching a patreon campaign they're kind of on the fence whether they want to do it or not just like we were saying limit yourself to your commitments until you know that this is going to fly don't make yourself spend a lot of work thinking writing doing any of this stuff if it's going to be for three dollars a month it's it's just not worth your time do consider that. Um, I did. Ha I used to have rewards that I would have to mail, and it. And besides the books, um, and you know, it's stickers and those kind of things. And it turns out that I am just the worst person with the post office ever. I hate going there. I hate everything <laughs> about it. And I'll put it off forever, and I'll let people down. Um, so I got rid of those. Um, be willing to experiment as well. If you know, if something isn't working, you get to change it. Um, I thought I was locked into writing these essays on creativity for the rest of my life until one of my wonderful patrons, Mariah and friend said, just change it. You can change it. It's your Patreon. Your supporters want to support you. You're not locked into anything. You can always change these things. 
I, I uh, have a friend who has a Patreon campaign, and she had a podcast where she interviewed people who, uh, who you know, had a, a story of change in their life, and it was an interview uh, podcast. And she pivoted; she started launching a new podcast that was a Pray Every Day podcast. She's actually one of the other guests we have on this show, and she changed her Patreon from the one podcast to the other podcast, completely different format. And she lost, as far as I know, zero patrons <laughs> because they were all backing her. <laughs> and she has a lot more patrons now because people are like we. Love love the new thing that you're doing. We want to support it. That's wonderful. That's exactly right. And and I think one last point that you point, brought up that I think is really important, and, and that is that you iterated. You didn't, you didn't say stuck with your original goals. You took in uh, reader feedback or, or patron feedback and you adapted. And I think that that's really important is that a Patreon campaign, any kind of crowdfunding campaign needs to be a living creature. It's, you know, you water it, you prune it, you fertilize it, like you, you let it grow and hopefully it grows into something that it wasn't at the beginning. It gets bigger and more mature and your needs get, you know, more developed and the tools are getting better. So uh, word on the street is that Patreon is working on a solution for the mailing stuff to patrons problem <laughs> so that there's really? some company or some way of doing that that's going to make it easier. So I don't think that's been rolled out yet. But once they do and everyone gets a t-shirt that's the right size for them that's mailed to them automatically, man, that's going to be really great when that's around. No, that would be amazing. <laughs> that would seriously be amazing. I also had a phone call with them at one point um, and told them how much I love Remind.com. And they, you know, this is, I know nothing about this, but they did sound really interested and intimated that they had thought about doing some kind of um, confidential texting service like that because people really, really enjoy it. And, you know, they don't want us using Remind. They want us staying within the Patreon world. That's right. So, uh, Rachel, thank you so much uh, for coming on the show. Where can people find out uh, more about you? Uh, RachelHeron.com. It's spelled like Michael, R-A-C-H-A-E-L, and uh, Patreon.com slash Rachel, R-A-C-H-A-E-L. And I'm always on Twitter, Rachel Heron. All right. And we will have links to all of those places uh, in the show notes. Rachel, thank you so much for coming on the Creative Funny Show. Thomas, it was just a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much. <laughs> 